Hello everybody, good morning and welcome to the Christocentric Meal, a daily reflection of your true identity in Christ Jesus. Abel Damina is my name. Hey, get ready. Today we're going to have a wonderful time of studying the word of his grace. You must invite friends, family members, everybody around you. Grab them, get them to connect to the broadcast. It's going to be a refreshing time of studying the word of God. Co-hosting the broadcast with me this morning is my wife, Dr. Rachel Damina. Honey, good morning. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before your word. Your word instructs that he who looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. Father, we pray that as viewers today who are connected to this broadcast, Listen to the word with an intent of doing it, an intent of applying the word and living up to the instructions of your word for the maximum benefit of their lives. We declare that veils fall off, clarity, your people edified, equipped, empowered, Jesus glorified today. Thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, today we're looking at praying for others. Or praying for the unsaved, specifically. Praying for others. We've been dealing with prayer, so we're going again into prayer again today. Honey, read for us Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all sins. The epistles concentrated more on praying for others than ourselves. There are different categories of people to pray for. We are to pray for the unsaved, those that are not saved. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers to harvest souls into the kingdom. The unsaved is the one who has not believed or heard the gospel of Christ. And the prayer is for them to believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. Read for us. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. His mind is blinded, the man that is not born again. That's why he keeps arguing. That's why he keeps saying things to discourage the people preaching to him, because his mind is blinded. You're telling him something, he's not even hearing you. His mind is blinded and needs the light in the gospel of Christ. This can only happen when the man hears the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without the preacher? The gospel has to be preached for the man to hear and then to believe. Therefore, he needs a preacher. If a preacher does not preach, men will not be saved. God has put the salvation of men in the hands of men. A man must preach for another man to hear, believe, and be saved. That's an awesome responsibility. And that's a very huge responsibility. In Romans chapter 10, verse 15, 16, and 17, read for us. And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I said, Lord, who had believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, Paul answered Isaiah. Isaiah said, who has believed our report, or who has believed our message? Then Paul answered him, Faith to believe the message by hearing. Hearing the message of Christ. That's the message an unsaved man must hear. Not the message of doom. Not the message of hell. Not the message of disaster. Not the message of a threat. But the message, the good news of what Christ has done on his behalf in spite of his condition and in spite of his sinful state. That God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ did. That's what the sinner ought to hear to be saved. Then, in praying for the unsaved, I pray for persons to reach the unsaved. In cases where you can directly reach the unsaved person, 
We pray that God will send laborers to harvest people into the kingdom. We break the influence of Satan over their minds. We break the control of Satan over their minds. We break the darkness over their minds. And we ask that God will steer up harvesters to harvest them to the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 37, honey, read for us. Then said he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The harvest is massive. There are people all over the world who have not heard. All they need is just to hear and they will believe. Or what they are hearing is not the right gospel. They are hearing another gospel or a pseudo gospel. You can also pray for a free flow of the gospel to his hearing. To pray that the word has a free course and be glorified. That the word of the Lord will have a free course in the hearts and minds of the unsaved. A free course and be glorified in their hearts. It will have a free course in their direction. A free flow without obstruction without interference, without blockades, mm. a free course into their minds and that it will be glorified in their hearts. That's a very powerful prayer to pray. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Yeah, that's what's exactly the yes. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And then lastly, you pray for boldness of the preacher sent to the unsaved person. Mm. You pray that the person that is sent will have boldness, will function in boldness, will speak the word with boldness and with confirmation. You pray for the preacher. And then you pray for the unsaved, especially those of us who are family members that are yet to be saved. We need to pray for them and believe God for them, for their salvation. Believe God for them to embrace the gospel. You know, the entire plan of God for man is salvation. So when you begin to pray for people to be saved, you are praying absolutely in line with God's desire, yes. with God's heartbeat. God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can't compromise this prayer. This is the first prayer mm. to have people to be saved. That is what God is all about. That's what the gospel is all about. That's what the kingdom of God is all about, to get people saved, to move them from darkness to light, to take them out of the shackles of darkness, out of the bondages of sin, and bring them into the glorious liberty of songs. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we're going to pray today. Pray together for people that are not yet saved and pray for people that are saved but have not understood what it means to be saved that they will come to the knowledge of the truth. So we pray for laborers to reach the unsaved that you are unable to reach. Yes. You know, because at least you can do that. Yep. There are people around you that you talk to them. Remember one time you categorized the sinner, yep. the unbeliever, yep. and the Christian. Yep. The unbeliever is the one who has heard the gospel and chooses to reject it. Yep. The sinner is the one who has not even heard the gospel. Right. And then we that are saved, those are who heard and believed, to go in here, you know, to take this gospel to those who have not heard and even to repeat it to those who have heard and right. not understand. And I'm not responding. So then you pray for them. The reason you need to pray for the unsaved, our words are not ours. Is the Lord. That is God's heart we are opening our mouth to bring to people. So you need to cook it in the spirit, so to speak, yep. and then bring it, you know, so that it comes absorbable yep. to the person that is receiving. Yep. Sometimes we carry raw word and just choking somebody and the unbeliever, in fact, then he will slap you. Yep. He will kick you or yep. he will do, you know, but when you cook it, like you always say, yep. you know, you, you mute her, ponder, be absorbed in it. So when you serve it, it uh, comes with it's power. Ready, yes. It comes with it comes power. With power and Irresistible power. And that the it unbeliever says, is arrested yeah, by that so word. That's you need to pray. And when you pray for people who preach, somehow, somehow, they have the right words. Yes, yes. They just say the you right words. Trans, they have you the have, right uh, words. You know, convincing words, too. Yeah. You know, remember Paul, he said, the man said, he almost that persuaded me to yeah. be a Christian. The testimony was so powerful. Too strong. Paul. You know, but it's just that perhaps you're a son of perdition or something. Why would he say almost you're persuading me? No, it's not because he was a son of Maybe perdition. Maybe I'm sure eventually he, will be, he became yeah. a Christian. I'm yeah. very sure. Because he was still trying to be a judge at the time instead of you know, being converted. Yeah. So I'm sure the word of God made impact on him. So 
cook it in prayer and then you know before you serve it to you pray over words so that the words will have meaning the mm. words will be impactful the words will come with clarity the words will come with power and it will address the specific mm. need in their lives, in their lives. you know you that will have a word of knowledge yeah, you know yeah it's called supernatural evangelism mm. when you minister to people along with the gifts of the spirit mm. it's supernatural evangelism mm. you share the love of god and you pray. preach and when you give yourself to prayer all those words all those things will manifest, manifest they'll be prayer. stirred up and when you go for evangelism, it's you power evangelism. Yes, it's power evangelism. Mm. Where miracles are needed, they happen. Yes. Whatever is needed, it happens. Yes. To bring the people to a place of complete persuasion that in the God gospel. That. Mm. That's right. And so that's why the prayer is important. You can't just afford to just preach ordinary word. Mm. You've got to back it up in prayer. That's why the apostle says we will give ourselves to the ministry of the mm. word mm. and prayer. Why? Prayer generates power. Mm. Prayer makes power available. Prayer tears up the power of God and sets it in motion and in operation. If believers and leaders, pastors, teachers, you know, take this prayer thing seriously, it will make room for less conversing about to prayer houses or going to mountains and collecting false powers and looking for side things to mm -hmm. use and demonstrate and make people think you're a powerful man of God. Very true. Get down to the word and pray the word. Right. Pray. Right. You know. You see manifestation That's right. of power. And you know, prayer makes power available. Mm. That is dynamic, it is working. Yes. So we pray, we give ourselves to prayer. And today you need to pray. If there are people around you, because you see, if people are not saved around you, they will persecute you. Satan will use them very easily to torment you and persecute you. But if you want to break the power of Satan over the city, then get people saved. The more people get saved, the more the devil has limited opportunity to function. If you pray for the people around you or you pray in the spirit, mm. you will be able to eliminate that manner of being an offense to yep. anyone. Yep. And instead you gain them. You will just be attract be attracted to them. Yep. And they want to be near you. They want to ask you questions about spiritual matters. You'll be a blessing. You'll be them. a blessing. Yep. And so you need to pray and for the unsaved and pray for others as well. And when you pray for people, you will be less critical of them. Because yes, when you pray for them, also. you pray in faith and you stand in faith. Mm -hmm. So it helps both you that prays and the people that you are being prayed for. Pray for. And that's why prayer has it's no awesome. alternative. Yeah. You've got to give yourself to pray and to prayer today. And we're believing God with you for people that are unsaved in your family, people that are unsaved around you, and people that are unsaved all over around us. We stand in faith right now in the name of Jesus. Jesus. And we declare that the power of Satan is broken over the minds and hearts of men, women, over the minds and hearts of young people around. Lord, we stand in faith for salvation, people getting saved, people saved all over the world. The unsaved coming to the glorious light of the gospel. And we declare, oh God, that laborers are stirred up to go to the harvest field. Men and women are stirred up into the harvest field today to minister the gospel. And as the word is ministered, we declare that the word goes forth with power. The word is back with signs and wonders. The word that goes forth will not come back void. Father, we trust you today for a massive harvest of souls through people that are connected to this platform right now. That everywhere your people are, they will reach out to somebody, one or two or three or five people today and bring to them the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And we decree a depopulating of hell and a populating of heaven. We declare, oh God, that your word will totally liberate the minds and hearts of men from everything that the enemy has used to keep them in bondage in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we believe you for massive salvation. Mm -hmm. Ratuba, Kilana, Makata, across the board, all over the world today. Everyone watching this devotional goes out aggressively today to depopulate hell and populate heaven. And we agree to Together for the salvation of men and women, even in families here. We believe you for that salvation in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, because that is your will in Christ Jesus. And we receive testimonies of massive salvation of souls today to the glory of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the blessing. And we declare that as your people go out, they are directed. Their steps are ordered to the right people, people that are ripe for harvest, to bring them into the kingdom. Yes. Father, we give you praise. And we honor you for answered prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. We're excited that every day we're able to look into the word of God, the mirror, to reflect who we are, what we have, and what we can do in Christ Jesus. We love you guys and we're so excited. Make sure you order for this devotion. And like I said, it is sermon notes for a preacher and diets for believers. Amen. You can't do without it. Order for friends and loved ones 
and make sure you order for members of your family and other resources that this ministry has put together for your spiritual edification. The announcer will tell you how to order for them at the end of this broadcast. But we're excited to be able to spend these moments with you teaching and praying together. Just before we go, honey, one last word for viewers around the world. Praying for others, praying for the unsaved is a blessing, not just to them, for the kingdom of God, and for you as well. Right. You know, when you pray for people, you end up having nothing to pray about for yourself. For yourself because when you really give yourself to pray for people, suddenly all your needs are taken care of. So praying for people is so critical. It's the highest form of expression of the love of God. Mm -hmm. So give yourself to pray for people today. Mm -hmm. Just go about praying for people. You know, reach out to people, pray with them, pray for them, and just express the love of God to them through prayer today and the whole of this week. We're excited that we're able to do this today. Yes. Looking forward to connecting with all of you again tomorrow. Same platform, same time. And until then, this is Rachel and Abel Damina saying that the kingdom of God is in power. important so you can come to epignosis a place of accurate precise exact knowledge it's very important amen there's a good part of listening sometimes also when you play the cd in your car you know sometimes you play the cd in your car but that is not enough to get you epignosis because sometimes you can get so distracted with the driving that you're not even paying attention so when it comes to epignosis you must make efforts to pay attention you must make efforts to pay attention. And James captures this much more. James captures this much more. So you know where you have EIO or Gnosis, which means to know in James 1.21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. Now, the background for this is in verse 20. Give me verse 20. For the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. Meaning that man's anger does not produce God's righteousness. Verse 22 now says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So, in the other part, he told you that the wrath of man doesn't work the righteousness. And the other part, he says, that doers of the word and not hearers only. Then in between, he now says, lay apart the superfluity of naughtiness. All right? So, the word lay apart is a Greek word, apothetimi. A-P-O-T-I-T-H-E-M-I, apothetimi, it, it's a conscious word. It actually means to cast something away. Same word used for putting off clothes. Lay aside, put off clothes, or consciously remove something. And there are other places where that word is used. Acts 7 58 and cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul they removed the clothes and laid them down so it's something they consciously did this was during the stoning of Stephen Stephen in Acts chapter 7 conscious effort there they took the clothes by themselves and cast it down Romans 13 12 the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of life. To cast off means like consciously remove. It's not an accidental, it's conscious. Verse 14 of Romans 13, verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on, cast off. Put on. All of these are conscious efforts. Cast off. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the loss thereof. Conscious effort. The idea is like wearing clothes. You want to change from official clothes and put on your house dress. 
you have to deliberately remove the official clothes and put on your casual dress. It's effort. Your clothes are not going to come off your body. You will have to put some effort, some energy, some concentration to remove the clothes and to even wear the other cloth, you have to deliberately, intentionally, with some effort, put on the other cloth. If you don't put, if you don't concentrate, you can wear the cloth inside out. You know what I mean? You can wear it inside out and walk, walk off. And people will say, hey, are you okay? Why are you wearing the inside of your cloth out? Because when you are putting it on, you were not conscious. You didn't put effort. You casually, and it reflected in the nature of wearing you wore. So in casting off their efforts and in putting on this effort, because you can't come to epignosis casually. There are efforts required. And same thing, you can't put off and put on casually. There's effort required. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, you put something on by putting something off. If you don't take off these clothes, you cannot wear the other clothes. You can't carry your house clothes and put them on your official clothes. You will look like a man who is mentally agitated. In fact, it's not going to look good on you. Even you yourself will know something is wrong with you. Ephesians 4.22. We are dealing with, you know, uh, lay, lay off the superfluity of naughtiness. Ephesians 4.22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws. You put off, you put off, next verse. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, next verse. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness, 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So you put off, you put on with consciously with efforts Colossians 3 8 Colossians 3 8 but now you also put off all this put off all this anger wrath malice blasphemy filthy communication out of your mouth put it off put it off is a conscious thing like putting off your clothes you put off anger. Anger is not going to go automatic. You have to put it off. All right? Now, 1 Peter 2.1. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. We are for laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. You, you lay aside, conscious. Hebrews 12.1. Hebrews 12.1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every wave and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The race that is set before us. So, apotatime is used oftentimes. For example, look at the use of it again in Matthew 14.3. Matthew 14.3. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. He had bound him and put him in prison. So when, you, when that word is used, it is used for something you dislike or something you don't need. Before putting it away, it therefore means there must be a judgment call. Before you put away, there must be a judgment call. Because what you're putting away, it's usually used for things you don't like. Put away anger. Put away malice. Put away hypocrisies. Something you normally don't like. 
That's where that word is applied or that word is used. So there must be a judgment call. Before putting away, you must say, I don't want to put on this. I want to put on that. There's got to be a judgment call. I don't want this. I want that. Amen. Yeah. When you woke up this morning and you were coming to the service, I'm sure this is not all the cloth you had in your house. But there was a judgment call. Some of you made that decision last night. Some of you made that decision this morning. And some of you made that decision on Tuesday. Some of you even made that decision last week. Two Sundays from now, I will wear this dress. Taylor, make sure it is ready. You made the decision. That's not the only cloth you have. You have a number of clothes. But there was a judgment call. And you said, no, I don't want to wear this. I want to wear that. Deliberately. And you made sure it was ready for you to put on. And you wore it and you are here right now seated with that cloth on you. By choice. None of you just stood up from your bed and the cloth flew on your body and you started walking with it. Nobody had that experience. So before you put away, there must be a judgment call. Romans 13, 12. Put it up for me. Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off. We are the ones to cast off. It is not God that will do the casting off for us. We are the ones that will cast us. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. There must be a judgment call. Ephesians, where we read, say, put away. When James said it in James 1.20, what he implied is that there must be a dislike for it. We can teach all we want to teach on a Christian bearing grudges until you see it as unfit for you, you will not remove it. Until you see that grudges don't fit your status. Until you see that bitterness don't fit your status. Until you see that anger don't fit your status. Until you see that strife don't fit your status. You won't put it off. You will hear us teach it. You will even join us in teaching it. But you are not persuaded. Until you see who exactly you are and the reality of your identity dawns on you, then it is easy for you to start removing things that don't fit into who you are. You've got to be able to see the true definition of who you are in Christ. It is in the light of that that you put off things that don't fit into that definition. Because until then, if you're a victim of identity crisis, you will not know who you are. And if you don't know who you are, anything goes. Anger, strife, malice. And if we ask you, why are you malicious? You say, ah, uh -uh. is there anybody that is not malicious? Because you don't know who you are. You don't know who you are. So, anything goes. You wear anything. Anger, strife. You even we are fighting inside church. You know, there are people that fight in church. I mean, they fight. No, I didn't say they fight. I mean, they fight. You are not, you are not catching. I didn't say they fight. I mean, they fight in the church. Why? To them, don't cheat me because I'm in church. I'll show you who I am. So, they carry the dead man and put him on and reflect him. Consciously. Because they don't know who they are. Why didn't you come to church this morning with rags? Why didn't you go to your wardrobe and look for that trouser that does not fit you? That trouser that you've grown bigger than. Why didn't you wear it and come to church? And walk like this? Because it doesn't fit. And you know you've grown past it. 
Nothing can make you put it on. You've judged that that trouser is unfit for you and nothing can make you put it on. Sister, why didn't you wear that dress that when you wear, you'll be walking like this? Why? Because you have judged that that dress does not fit your personality anymore. So why are you still malicious? You have not judged malice. So malice still fits you. Which actually, if you know who you are, is a misfit. So there must be a judgment call. Am I communicating here? There must be a judgment call. There are things I, I can never wear. Never. Why? They don't fit. They don't fit me. So that's why Paul used those words to begin to establish your, your identity and what is expected to flow out of your identity in Christ. But before you even judge, you have to recognize it. Before you arrive at a judgment, you have to recognize it. So epignosis means to appreciate. You appreciate Philemon 1 6 that the communication of your faith may be effectual by the appreciation of every good thing that is in you because you are in Christ. You appreciate it. You appreciate the good thing that is in you. You value that good thing that is in you. I can't have epignosis without investigation to distinguish. I have to investigate. What are the good things that are in me because I am in Christ? And what are those things that are not supposed to be in me because I am in Christ? I begin to distinguish by, by, by identifying what ought to be in me and what ought not to be in me. I've got to check that out. I've got to make, uh, I've got to make that decision. Glory. Are you here? I've got to make that decision. Uh, the reason for epignosis is because you have a choice. So before you put away, there's a judgment call. This is not my nature. This is contrary to Christ. I can't afford to behave like this. It does not fit who I am. Hello. I hope you have been blessed by that wonderful message. The Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. For you to grow spiritually, you need to hear study and meditate on the word. You need to not only hear but to also read and see. And that is why you need the Christocentric meal. This is a book that reveals to you who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. This book interprets and breaks down the word into daily meals, making it easier for you to understand and study, build up and strengthen your inner mind, all the while growing your relationship with God and your confidence as a believer. To order this life-changing book and other titles, DVDs, and CDs by Dr. Abel Damina, call the number or email the address on the screen. Starting the new year with this book is your first step to guaranteeing an enriched life and new year.